Okay, so if you've ever used the London Underground, there's one thing you're probably thankful for, and that's the fact it's run by electricity. When the Metropolitan Line was opened in 1860, it was a very different premise entirely. Yes, okay, it was an underground system and the first one in the world. However, it was powered by steam engines. Every time a steam engine would come into the underground station, you'd probably be choked by noxious fumes of sulphur and smoke and so on. It wasn't a particularly pleasant um, thing to kind of encounter, especially if you're trying to do a commute. One man changed that. Charles Edward Spagnoletti. He was an Italian by birth, and for 40 odd years he was actually working on the Great Western Railway um, in charge of many of their gauges and so on. It, basically that was his life's work. When he retired aged 50, he decided to go freelance, and it was in his freelance period that he actually created a lot of his best known work. For example, the electrification of a London Underground Line. Now, when the Northern Line originally opened, uh, much to much fanfare, for example, King Edward VIII and the Duke of Clarence were in attendance, they were all powered by steam engines, but he had another idea. He was fascinated by the use of electricity. He saw it as the way future, you know, the way to go. It was the future of modern travel. So it was the first line to be completely electrified, not only in terms of the trains, but in terms of the lighting, uh, in terms of the signage and so on. You know, he, get, he really wanted to kind of clean up the act of the London Underground. So what he did is that he basically installed various cables with all his um, know-how and knowledge from his previous work at the Great Western Railway, Working alongside um, engineers such as Sir John Fowler, Benjamin Baker and so on, he basically created London's first modern tube line. And when uh, King Edward descended from Kennington Tube Station when it was opened, he saw a gleaming hall of bright shining lights, electric trains, clean air, to the point where John Fowler, the great um, engineer of the Metropolitan Line, said, actually, do you know what, there are probably going to be health benefits to this. I think everyone should take an electric trip to benefit their health. And it's just simply because of his work. Now he was a very um, bombastic and very dedicated Italian gentleman. He was known for wearing white waistcoats and lavender gloves um, and he certainly was uh, a cut above the rest in terms of not only in style but also in talent too. But again he's buried here in a very plain grave not up on the main avenue. Again his talent largely forgotten. Imagine the scene. It's 1912 and it's Westminster Abbey. The bells are in full peal. All the greater good of the medical profession and indeed London society have turned out for the funeral of one of the greatest men of the late Victorian era. From that spot they come to this spot in Hampstead Cemetery where the remains of Sir Joseph Lister are lowered into this very grave. Now if you're not familiar with the name Sir Joseph Lister you're probably familiar with one of his most famous products. Not that he invented it, his name was lent to it, Listerine mouthwash. But Sir Joseph Lister was a pioneer in antiseptic surgery. Now he started his career in Scotland working as a surgeon but he was very closely following the work of a gentleman by the name of Louis Pasteur, who was concerned with germ theory. Now, Lister was a surgeon, and at this time surgeons were concerned with how well they were perceived. A number of their aprons were crusted and stained with the blood of previous surgeries, you know, never mind the fact it was completely unhygienic. They took this as a badge of honour. Now, whether the patient survived or not was neither here nor there. Lister, had different ideas. He thought if we could sterilise the kind of um, the, the surgical procedures, perhaps we could improve patient lifespan. So he was looking at the work of a gentleman by the name of Rudge, who, ins um, who invented a, um, a, a a kind of a product called creosote. And now creosote was used to preserve wood. Now, obviously, to preserve wood, it kind of creates a, um, a, kind, of, a, a kind of an environment where no bacteria can get in to kind of eat and dissolve the wood. So he thought, well, if I made a solution of this, could this be applied to an operation scenario? So what he did is that he patented a kind of spray, which would be sprayed over the patient's wound or whatever was going on, and he would then use that to basically ensure that the patient survived so no infection could get in. Now, this was a breakthrough. Now, he very closely followed the work of Louis Pasteur, who kind of pioneered this kind of technique. And he was the talk of the town for London. You know, many of his patients actually survived, you know, from very simple um, kind of uh, um, procedures you know, like a broken leg or an amputation whereas before they would have died and miraculously they actually started to live so he actually changed the face and indeed the survival rate of most life-changing surgeries his talent didn't stop there because in in the early 1900s King Edward VII uh, Victoria's son who uh, took her throne complained of chest pain um, and stomach pains as well and he was brought onto the scene essentially to treat what was wrong with the king now the king was a workaholic, he didn't believe anything was wrong, but it was the work of Frederick Trees, who was the best friend of the Elephant Man, and Joseph Lister who diagnosed the fact that he had some sort of 
abscess on his appendix. Now this required skill, which as a surgeon in Frederick Street would very happily deliver, but it was Lister who was there to administer the, um, the antibiotic properties and indeed the anaesthetic to make sure that the king lived. Saved the life of the monarch, um, and you know, even at his funeral, the king, the king was actually profoundly grateful for the work of Joseph Lister. And again, in this kind of forgotten part of Hampstead Cemetery, we owe so much to this man. The NHS, the World Health Service even, is all because of his sterling work. So, if anyone hears you Spotify or YouTube, or indeed listen to any kind of music at any time they wanted to, it's all largely down to the efforts of this man. The grave is of Frederick Gaysburg, who was an American by birth, who was born in Washington DC, and he basically made music available for the masses. Now, back in the Victorian era, if you wanted to hear your favourite requiem or kind of, um, you know, any kind of music, um, you would either have to listen to it in your head or go to see it be performed live, which probably, you know, for most people, probably be about a maximum four or five times in their entire lifetime. Fred Gaysbro thought, no, this isn't good enough. What we can do is that we can utilise the power of technology to bring music to the masses. Now, he was, um, he actually opened up a studio in the 1890s and started working for the Gramophone Company. And using experimental technology, actually started to record anything and everything, from farmyard noises to the sound of opening doors to even opera singers and so on, because he was fascinated by music and sound. And indeed, if anyone's familiar with the Beatles, for example, George Martin, the first A&R man, they say, he was basically the template. They say his powers of diplomacy would have made most diplomats jealous. You know, he could handle the most tricky of artists and so on. Um, one of his crowning achievements was actually when he recorded the Italian um, opera singer Enrique Caruso. Now, Enrique Caruso, if you're familiar with the Go Compare adverts, uh, he was very much of that type. He was in his mid-twenties. He was kind of rotund, twizzly moustache, very bombastic and very popular. Um, and he heard his voice and was instantly in love. You know, he heard him in La Scala and thought, this needs to be committed to some sort of record. So he went up to Caruso and said, okay, well, we're gonna record your voice if that's okay with you. And he went, oh yeah, that's fine, that's fine. I mean, I'm slightly skeptical because this means surely people won't come to my performances, but I'll give it a try. Stated his fee, um, Gaysburg then went back to the gramophone company and said, right, this is what uh, Caruso wants in terms of a fee. And they sent back a telegram in bold capital letters, essentially saying, too much, fee exorbitant, do not bother. Gaysburg went, no. No, he's got a voice of an angel. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pay for him out of my own pocket and record him and see how it does. And that's what he did. Next day, Caruso turns up at his hotel room and basically starts recording. Slightly tentatively at first, but then once he gets into the swing of things, he starts singing beautiful music. To the point that Gaysburg actually did a cartoon of him singing, which he presented to him afterwards. Now, the recording equipment of the time was fairly rudimentary. It was basically a square horn, which you had to sing into at point-blank range. Uh, the piano accompaniment had to be done at the exact same level as the microphone. So the actual piano had to be hoisted up onto planks so that it could be played at the same level so the horn could record the sound. Now, Gaysburg uh, recorded it and everything went well and he started to sell it. Remarkably, an amazing bestseller. It was sold over 300,000 units, which considering the time that this was uh, recorded, you know, this was done when the technology was incredibly new, was an amazing feat. And it basically kick-started not only Enrique Caruso's career, he actually got a gig at Covent Garden Theatre a couple of months afterwards. It also cemented the, um, the basically the recording industry and led to the modern music industry as we know it today. You know, never mind George Martin, the Beatles, or any kind of recording companies. Because of him, we can listen to things on Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, Tidal, whatever you want to listen to, all because of his efforts. And we owe you that man a great debt. Now, for many of you who used to buy records from a physical shop, let's say HMV, there's a particular painting that you might be familiar with. For example, his master's voice. It's the sound of a little Jack Terry listening to a gramophone while music plays, probably to the sound of his master's voice, as his um, painting is called. Well, the artist is actually called Francis Broad, and he's buried here. He was the one who painted it. So, here we are at the grave of basically the Edwardian era Celine Dion. This is Marie Lloyd, although when she was born, she was plain old Matilda Wood. Now, when she was born, she had a natural aptitude for being a performer. Indeed, she was the eldest of nine siblings, and many of them would actually help her as an ensemble cast to perform music and stage shows and, show and so on, um, basically for the benefit of the local community. And she was a great performer, just nat had a natural flair, starting off the Eagle Tavern and then working her way up to other kind of uh, music halls and theatres up and down the land. Now, Marie Lloyd was known as the nation's sweetheart, and the general public absolutely adored her, simply because of her songs. Many of her songs were very tongue-in-cheek. Um, many of them had a double meaning. For example, she's never had her ticket punched before. Yeah. Um, and, other, and other such songs, you know, she, she clearly liked to kind of uh, ramp up the double entendre. 
which survived long after she passed. You know, you have shows like Are You Being Served using it, right up to Citizen Khan today. She was very much a purveyor of that kind of humour. Now, many of the songs that she sung, if you were to play back to your grandparents, your great-grandparents, if they heard them, they would instantly have brought a smile because they were instantly recognisable. And usually when I do a tour, I like to sing one of her songs because she was obviously a, a lady of the musical. So I'm going to sing um, When I Take My Morning Promenade. Now, this was written in 1908 by Mills and Scott. And it's basically, they. It, you can take it two ways. It's either about changing fashion or about a woman wanting a shag. One of the, either way you can take it, it doesn't matter, and that's it's the ambiguous meaning is what made it completely popular. So, here we go. Since Mother Eve in the garden long ago started the fashion, fashion's been a passion. Eve wore a costume we might describe as brief. Still every season brought a change of leaf. She'd stare if she could come to town. Oh, what would Mother Eve think of my new Parisian gown? Chorus. As I take my morning promenade, quite the fashion card on the promenade. Well, I don't mind nice boys staring hard if it satisfies their desire. Do you like my dress just a little bit? Just a little bit, not too much of it. If it shows my shape just a little bit, that's the little bit the boys admire. Fancy the girls in the prehistoric days each wore a bear skin to cover up her fair skin. Lately, Salome has charmed us, to be sure, wearing just a row of beads and not much more. Fancy me dressing like that too. I'm sure the Daily Mirror man would love an interview. As I take my morning promenade, quite the fashion card on the promenade. Well, I don't mind nice boys staring hard if it satisfies their desire. Do you like my dress just a little bit? Just a little bit, not too much of it. If it shows my shape just a little bit, that's the little bit the boys admire. I've heard my grandmother wore the crinoline, then came the bustle, oh, it was a tussle. Women were tied up and loaded up with dress. Now fashion plates decree we must wear less. Each year our costume grows more brief. I wonder when we'll get back to the good old fashioned leaf. As we take my morning promenade, quite the fashion card on the promenade. Well, I don't mind nice boys staring hard if it satisfies their desire. Do you like my dress just a little bit? Just a little bit, but not too much of it. If it shows my shape just a little bit, that's the little bit the boys admire. And there we are.